against the run of play. How an incumbent president was defeated in Nigeria by a loose gun at Iemi. Autour of power, politics and death. A front row account of the late President Yaradua. Dedicated to the memories of Mr. Felice Ueji Dadani and Chief, Mrs. Elizabeth Funmula Oedebea, and to all mothers. Published in Nigeria in 2017 by Kakifo Limited. Under its prestige imprint. 253 Herbert Macaulay Way. Yaba, Lagos, Nigeria. Info at kakifo.com www.kakifo.com Copyright to Loose Gun Adonai 2017 The right of Loose Gun Adonai to be identified as the author of this work has been asserted by him Ming. Accordance with the copyright laws. A catalog record for this book is available from the National Library of Nigeria. ISBN 978 978 546095. All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced, transmitted, or stored in a retrieval system, in any form or by any means, without permission in writing from the copyright holder. Layout by Akim Ibrahim. Cover design by Sonny Hughes. Introduction. The drama unfolding at the villa on 31st of March 2015, four days after the presidential election, would have profound implications for President Goodluck Abel Jonathan and the nation he led. Kneeling in front of Jonathan were his Attorney General and Justice Minister, Mr. Mohamed Bello Adok, San, Aviation Minister, Mr. Ozata Chidoka and Special Assistant to the President on Domestic Affairs, Mr. Wari Palmo Oidudafa. The mission of the three officials was to persuade Jonathan to call to congratulate his opponent, Major General Muhammad Yubahari, Retd, of the All Progressives Congress, APC, even as the final results were still being collated by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. Seated a few meters away in the room were Vice President Namadi Sambo, Akwa Ibom, Governor, Mr. God's Willak Pabio, Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Christian Pilgrims Commission, Mr. John Kennedy Opara and the Coordinating Minister for the Economy, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwila. Chidoka had co-opted Aduk and Dudafa to make the plea after a conversation he had with Jonathan the previous day. The president had acknowledged that the results were going against him and that he was going to concede. This was at a period when Nigerians were unsure of who would win, with many politicians within the then ruling People's Democratic Party PDP, still betting on Jonathan. He, meanwhile, had already asked Chidoka and a few others, including his spokesman, Dr. Ruben Abati, to give him a draft concession speech. For Jonathan, coming to terms with defeat was the culmination of what began four days earlier, when he arrived at a polling unit in his hometown of Ochuok, Bales Estate with his wife, Dame Patience for accreditation to vote under the full glare of the media. The country watched on live television as one card reader after another failed to read the president's biometrics. After four tries and close to about twenty minutes, Jonathan and his wife had to be accredited manually. Despite his earlier misgivings about the use of card readers for the election, which was also opposed by his party, Jonathan resisted the temptation to chip at the credibility of the exercise by graciously reaffirming his confidence in the process. President Jonathan is just one person, he told reporters. So, if we have problem with one person, as far as the election is going on well nationally, I'm not worried that there might be a delay. My interest is that we conduct a credible election. It was the first defining moment of the election. A disgruntled reaction could have easily set the wheels of political discord in motion and truncated the peace that had characterized the exercise up until that point. 
However, by Monday, 30th March, the atmosphere around Jonathan had been soured by reports suggesting the election may not have been as free and fair as he initially thought, especially in some of the northern states. With photographic evidence, Jonathan was shown how underage people were allowed to vote at some polling units in Cano and Bauke states. This inflamed those within the government who were urging Jonathan not to concede, even as it became increasingly clear that he had lost. The general feeling within the villa, a view fervently shared by Jonathan, was that the INEC chairman, Professor Itahai Rujega, was part of a northern conspiracy against him. With that, Jonathan decided to keep all options open. This emboldened some of his supporters who were desperate enough to want to disrupt the election. Among the strongest arguments for a potentially rigged election were the results from Cano State. Jonathan himself admitted as much to me in the course of our lengthy chat, saying, go and check the results from Cano. The presidential election and that of National Assembly happened on the same day and same time. The National Assembly result reflected that about 800,000 people voted but that of the presidential reflected a vote of about 1.8 million. I had reports of what happened but I decided that for such to be accepted, it meant that those who called themselves my supporters must have colluded. I was betrayed by the very people I relied on to win the election. However, Professor Mohammed Khanna, special assistant to Jigger, begged to differ. There is nothing particularly special about the Cano result, it is a general trend as many voters were more interested in the presidential election than in other elections. That was what happened across the country and you can go and do the tabulation, argued Khanna, who maintained that the use of card readers had made the election more difficult to rig. With the card reader, it is no longer possible to return results that are higher than the accredited voters. If you analyze the results nationally, you will discover the same trend. Despite his misgivings, by the time it became evident that he had lost, Jonathan was left counting the cost. In 2011 when Bahari did not campaign anywhere and could not have won the election, there was a spontaneous violent reaction that led to the death of several innocent people, including youth corps members, Jonathan reflected. I asked myself, what would happen in a situation in which there was already internal and international conspiracy in his favor? I could not bear the thought of anybody dying, so I told myself I had only one option and that was to concede. There were many around Jonathan who did not share his sense of magnanimity. Tuesday, 31st of March 2015 was therefore a dramatic day, with the abortive attempt by the Niger Delta minister and ally of the president, Elder Godstay Obibi, to disrupt proceedings at the Enec Collation Center, a spectacle that unfolded on live television. Although he would later apologize for his misadventure, Obibi's histrionics were part of a grand plan to disrupt the election, a plot that failed essentially because other parties involved refused to play to the script. While Jäger did not have the exact details of what would happen, he had nonetheless been alerted to the fact that there would be a disruption in the process, including a kidnap threat. On arrival at the collation center that morning, we discovered that the gate between the International Conference Center and Nikon Luxury Hotel, which was always locked, had curiously been opened, recalled a security officer detailed to work with Jager. A decision was immediately taken for the INEC chairman not to leave the collation hall under any circumstances. Jagger's handlers proposed a live television feed of the Electoral Commission's activities so that whatever happened, the whole world would witness it. In the security official's narration, of course, Jagger is usually a calm person, but given what he already knew, there was no way he was going to take the bait of Ubibi who kept shouting, Jagger, go to your office. We knew what the whole plan was about and had resolved not to play into their hands. Meanwhile, at the villa, the drama was also being watched on television. 
while the outcome must have deflated the hawks around Jonathan who were still looking for a way out of the looming defeat, it worked in favor of those who wanted him to concede before the final tally of the results. With OBB's antics dealt with by Jagger, Inek continued to process the results from the remaining states. Chidoka pleaded, why don't you take the wind off Jagger's sail? By calling Bahari, you would have rendered whatever Inek is doing redundant. This school of thought won the day. At one point, Judafa stood up and said loudly to Jonathan, Daddy, anybody can say whatever they like but we are leaving this house on May 29th. You have done your best for Nigeria and the people will appreciate your sacrifices. Shortly thereafter, Jonathan got up from his seat and went into his study where he picked up the phone and asked Control 4 to get Bahari on the line. He spoke briefly with Bahari, in a rather nervous tone, and then came out to announce to those in the room that he had conceded and congratulated the APC candidate on his victory. A relieved Chidoko asked, Can I tell the world? Go ahead, Jonathan directed, and Chidoka sent out a tweet from his mobile phone at exactly 5.23 pm, Nigerian time. And with that call, Jonathan pulled Nigeria back from the precipice, saving the country from what would have been a serious crisis, the ending of which nobody could have foretold. But the story did not end there. There were still attempts by some persons close to the president to use the party hierarchy to fight the outcome of the election. After President Jonathan had accepted defeat, congratulated Bahari and the whole world was acclaiming him, some party leaders and governors now wanted me to release a press statement that would ridicule me before civilized people and cause serious problems for our country. The then PDP national chairman at the time, Al-Haji Ahmed Adamu Muazu 5 told me. Looking back, there are many hanging questions. Was the concession a jump or a push? If the former, was it out of altruism? If the latter, was Jonathan coerced by some Western powers as insinuated in some quarters? Did he simply concede out of a personal conviction that it was the right thing to do? Having been defeated at the polls, even more importantly, against the backdrop of the pervasive notion that it was virtually impossible to defeat an incumbent Nigerian president with all the resources at his disposal. How did Jonathan lose the election? Writing this book presented the complex challenge of finding out what exactly happened. I spoke to as many of the actors as possible and went back to corroborate what each had told me in the light of new revelations from others. In choosing the title, I had bonded on a lot of things. It was not only about the defeat of an incumbent president, however unprecedented that may be in Nigeria, but also the fact that he conceded so quickly, something that was also unprecedented and unexpected. The pre-election rhetoric was dominated by threats of violence. Many members of the political and business elite had either relocated their families abroad or prepared to move them once crisis erupted. The situation was not helped by a controversial statement which emanated from the presidency seven weeks to the election that, Bahari can never be president of Nigeria. Quote me any day any time. Instead of Bahari to become president of Nigeria, Nigeria would rather break. A military coup will even be allowed than for Bahari to become the president of a democratic Nigeria, quote me any day, any time. 6 While the statement was quickly disavowed following a public outcry, there is a way in which Obibi's actions at the inoculation center slotted perfectly into that narrative. For instance, Mr. Otomi Amaki recounted to me an encounter he had a few days to the election at Heathrow Airport in London with a close supporter of Jonathan from Bales Estate who told him, Amaki, when are you people in the APC going to stop this joke? Let us, at least for the sake of argument, agree that Bahari wins the election, do you imagine for a second that Jonathan will be foolish enough to hand over the presidency to him? Have you ever seen such a thing happen in Nigeria? You people should wake up from your pipe dream. 7 However, 
the presidential election was lost and won even before the first ballots were cast, essentially because it had been defined as a referendum on the incumbent. But the loser also, for the first time in the history of elections in Nigeria, congratulated the winner, and that was not part of the script. Almost two years on, it is clear that the expectations that fueled the change of government have not been met. Against the background of the health challenge that kept President Buhari in the United Kingdom for 51 days, with hints that he would need further medicals abroad, there is already a feeling of despondency, with no certainty as to how it will all play out. Although each of the actors interviewed for this book spoke from their own perspective, it is easy to glimpse from their narratives the political dynamics that combined to oust an incumbent president in Nigeria, as well as why there was only one sensible option after the votes were in. In the final analysis, there are several lessons to draw, not only for the beneficiaries of Jonathan's defeat, who are now traveling the same hard road but also for those who seek to understand the pitfalls of power within the context of a multi-ethnic and multi-religious African country. Alus Gunadani Abuja 10th of March, 2017 for control is what the Asa Rock Telephone Exchange Room is called. 5 I documented what transpired between Muazu and then Akwai Bomb Governor, Mr. Godswillak Pabio and his Cross River State counterpart, Mr. Lyle Imoke, in my column, Inside the PDP Tower of Babel, published in Thursday on 7th of May, 2015. 6 A Blackberry Messenger, BBM, statement by Deji Adeyanju, an official in the office of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Public Affairs, Dr. Doinokoop in February 2015 which drew sharp reaction from the opposition, essentially since the official in question was handling Okup's Twitter handle. 7 Then Rivers State Governor, Chairman of the Nigeria Governors Forum and Director General of the Bahari Campaign, 